Hi, right, everybody, welcome back to Las Vegas. We're here at the Venetian Conference Center. This is Dave Vellante with Rob Strecce. Day one, we got three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. The Cube's here extracting the signal from the noise. Tom Black is the Executive Vice President and General Manager for HPE Storage Cube alum, and Casey Taylor, first time on the Cube, COO of HPE Storage Group. Guys, welcome to the Cube. Casey, Thanks. good to have you on for the first time. Thanks, Good to see now, you again, thank you. You're very welcome. Now, Casey, I saw you in action in April down at Storage Day. You were sort of emceeing the whole thing, and I said That's to you, right. wow, if you ever need a job at theCUBE, you'd right, you be yeah. great. Yeah. And, uh, so, but that was a big day for you all. It was the first time I was actually in Houston, loved the facility, great vibe. So, since then, what's been the reaction? I mean, now we're here at Discover, you get to, you guys kind of pre-announced, not pre-announced, but you announced, and now you get to thread, connect the dots to Discover. What's, what's new since April? That's right. Well, it's been rolling thunder, honestly, uh, since even before April. We've had a world tour um, connecting with, you know, customers, partners, and our field to really get everybody ready for all these major announcements. Uh, 2023 is the year of storage. Which, is, um, which has been great, and so there's been a huge amount of focus on um, you know, our roadmap and our launches, and so we're continuing the momentum since we saw you, and obviously excited to be here at Discover um, with some new, new announcements and um, adding some features to some of our services, so um, it's been a busy time. Yeah, when well, we're going to get into some of the announcements, but, but Tom, I want to give the audience an opportunity to understand the strategy. The interesting thing that I learned when we spent some time together in April is you came over from Aruba, right, from the networking side of the business, which of course is, is an awesome business, right, and they brought you in, Antonio put you in charge, and says, okay, I want you to sort of think, rethink the strategy, this is my take, you can tell me this, and I want you to really drive some commonality uh, across the portfolio, so explain the strategy that you're embarking on. Sure, so thanks Dave. So if you think about, um, and actually, in Silicon Valley, there's kind of this bus tour that yeah. goes around between networking and storage companies. Yeah. In fact, uh, you know, one of my old supervisors runs NetApp, and my boss's boss runs Peer, uh, and the engineers kind of go everywhere. We've chatted about this before. It's because fundamentally, both, both industries are highly complex systems. Uh, both industries have similar routes to market, B2B sales forces, and actually are built, the hardest thing we do is large scale, highly available distributed systems, which is common, right? Um, now, the art, state of the art in a router is how good you throw away data, state of the art in data, <laughs> and storage is how well you save data. So a little difference there. But the, the thing I noticed coming in was that while we had a, a strong, very strong loyal customer base, um, the, the portfolio uh, kind of, it, it lacked a common theme. Right, so we, we appeared a bit fragmented as we thought about things um, moving forward. Um, secondarily, you know, having been in this situation before, obviously there were some very strong players in the market, so it was about take a step back and look at where, have, where has really the data growth gone and where have workloads exponentially increased in size? <coughs> and the answer was a public cloud. And so, when you talk to customers, you know, as we, Antonio said today, 70% of the workloads are still on-prem. Some verticals, it's even more. Um, some verticals, less. But just take, take that as a number. The, the real reason the public cloud won was not a financial model. The public cloud won on an operational model, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, we decided to make that our mantra in True North, that everything we were going to do would be based on the cloud operational model. And so we, um, we took the, the heritage of the Aruba networking platform, we made it a common platform for the company, HP GreenLake Cloud Platform that Fidelma Russo runs, and then we started putting services on top. So you can think of my organization as building the kinds of services one might consume from a hyperscaler. And then as we started down that journey, what became really clear is customers liked our operational model and our cloud control plane um, so much so that they wanted to be able to visualize and see not just their on-premise estate, but also their public cloud estate. And so if you think through what we announced on April 4th was the, you know, we've collapsed all of block storage onto the Electra platform, and that thing continues to grow in triple digits for us. Most successful 
product that we've ever built in the company. But the latest member of the Electra family called MP lets you go from a, a tiny box to many boxes. You know, dozens of you know, controllers for I.O. processing, it performances what you need, dozens of media shelf personas. It's all the same system. It's just how you describe your workload is how the system, how a cluster ultimately gets configured. Mm. And then we made it multi-protocol. As, as you know, on the, on, the, uh, on the fourth, we announced our file offer on it as well. So really sticking to that cloud operational model, mm. sticking to simplicity. And we brought that forward today with um, really three kinds of, three additions, if you will, to the to the portfolio and the and the Green Lake Cloud Platform family, one is we enhanced our SaaS backup and recovery based service to include popular applications like MS SQL, RDS from Amazon, EKS, EC2, EBS. So now you can create one data protection policy, and whether the VM is in Amazon or Azure or on premise in VMware, you you get to apply that protection policy. Um, the second thing we announced was Storage Fabric Manager, because um, as you know, Rob, right? Oh, yeah. SANS are a bit of a, of a, of a dark art, yes. if you will. There's uh, Illuminati <laughs> that, that you, you go somewhere to become an expert and on Especially this. with the skills gap now. I mean, yes. like people, it, it, both, they've all deal. gone away. That's the, right, so, once it works, it's like, don't touch yes. my SAN. Yeah, not don't, touch don't, the SAN. <laughs> yeah, that's the last call you want to make as you scan at it. Um, so uh, we decided to make that a very simple um, uh, uh, cloud service to help you visualize, deploy, you would remember spot checks. Yes, Rob, exactly. right? Against yeah. all that's automated. And we also, the way we build everything on the cloud is it's all a, a reusable microservice approach. So if you think about a scale out block system, uh, uh, under the hood, actually the microservices that are the storage fabric manager are called behind the scenes to manage the fabric. So I'm no longer building custom code for every different use case. I'm in a cloud-like model. And then the last big announcement, which Antonio previewed, and then we followed up with today, is Private Cloud Business Edition, which the easiest way to think about it is it's a VM vending machine, right? So you describe your workload, or you describe your cores, your memory, your storage. We ship you network, we ship you compute, we ship you storage, and then you go to our cloud service, you plug in the black cable for power, the blue cable for network, and it dials into the cloud, you activate the, the uh, vending machine, if you will, and now the interaction between the operator and our service is at, at a VM primitive level. Whether it's that on-premise VMware substrate or whether your VMs are in Azure or AWS. Again, all one policy for how you define your workloads, particularly data protection. So kind of move to store, if you think about April 4th, that was really a hardcore storage expansion. Today was broadening into workloads and enhanced data protection. So Casey, I got to ask you from a COO's perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look at the storage business, HP, is it, it, it's good to great. You got a good business, but you got to make it great. I mean, Rube is a great business, right? Your HPC and AI business, a lot of potential upside there, but storage is a good business, it's what, four, billion or so, I want to say, and, and it's, but generally speaking, the industry, it's a more profitable, but service is a good business, right? It's actually a great business. Yeah. So, what are your objectives in terms of the storage business? Is it gain share? Is it to drive profitability? Yes and yes, and kind of what's the strategy to get there? All of the above, yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to take it from very good um, to great. I mean, Tom and the team have done a lot of work over the last few years to get the product side really humming and um, and you know make sure that we have that full portfolio story, store, manage, and protect now, right? Um, so I think we're there and now it's about how do we um, accelerate, how do we execute, uh, and go after where the market opportunity is. Uh, and Antonio also, you know, in a recent business review with both of us, you know, told us exactly that, right? We need to get this business going and we need to um, double down, right? So it's a huge focus for the company. Um, it's, it's also a proof point for the platform up till now um, with, the, with the services that we've put on, um, you know, really leading the way. Yeah, and I, I think you were saying earlier that you went on this tour and we're talking to a lot of customers over the last, you know, many months. How has that influenced 
exactly what you're seeing and how you're tuning that, tuning the message, tuning your go-to-market. How, how is that mm -hmm. going to help going forward? Yeah, it's super helpful speaking to customers and partners. You know, you hear from them the truth. Um, you know, uh, good, bad, the ugly. Um, it's been wonderful to bring them along on the journey with us and, and early so that they can really have an impact on the offers as we release them. Uh, I think that that was a big difference for the April 4th launch, was the, you know, the amount that we brought people kind of into the tent early and, and got feedback. Um, and great feedback, right, that actually really did end up in the product or the service that we've launched. So um, what we're hearing is really um, confirmation that the strategy, the company strategy is uh, resonating. And you know, there really is that appetite for the cloud operational model, right? Um, multi-cloud, on-prem, um, that, that is definitely a, a customer in demand. And uh, you know, so I think that the services that we are launching are, are resonating because of that easy um, to, to use, manage, provision model. So yeah, I'll, I'll tag on that one a little bit because it, it tells you a bit about how different this is than even just a few years ago. So one of the things we learned is we've basically stopped using PowerPoint in yeah. most of our meetings with partners and customers. In fact, I have sales leaders that have outlawed PowerPoint um, from their team's usage. Um, Casey, recently we put a call out, uh, hey, in, in a few weeks we're going to meet in a certain city. This was for partner sales reps to get up to speed on the things that you saw today. Mm. Two day meeting. 200 people showed up out of nowhere, not a single piece of PowerPoint. All they were, they were on console the whole time. Um, Antonio himself can get on console and demonstrate to customers. So yeah. he, he stopped bringing my, you know, our old PowerPoint decks, and he just says, fire up, fire, give me on the production cluster, and he'll start clicking around, showing how you provision a VM yeah. or set up packets. So just a real shift um, has come out of these engagements, which is, mm -hmm. if you believe a picture's worth a thousand words, getting on console, it's worth a million. So how does that affect, so you think about the traditional storage business, it's a box mentality, we got, it's, it's faster, cheaper, better, it's a better box, right? Now when you think about a console as your interface, yeah. what's behind that is, yeah, there's boxes behind that, but that's not what I consume. So right. people would ask, well, are you, are you getting out of the box business? Are you, you know, what about Electra? What happens there? So how do you think about of storage today? So we're certainly in the business of selling hardware. In fact, I would argue our hardware is really good um, hardware. Um, the, the point though, if you think about customer agility, is when you interface with one of our cloud services, your, your, your kind of methods and procedures for maintenance, for configuration, for monitoring, um, don't change as you move across the different configurations or Electra systems. I think I support six different box uh, or block uh, hardware systems under the block storage portfolio, but it's a unified experience. So you're not retraining your staff on every iteration of technology. You have the same APIs hold true, your same provisioning workflows hold true. So it's really about how do you get our customer away from spending a lot of time trying to figure out every box to trusting that we'll get them the right box for the right workload, mm -hmm. yeah. but they don't have to retrain every time. Especially important, Dave, in the partner community. The amount of time it takes to ramp partner SEs every time you change, fundamentally change a whole system mm -hmm. is non-trivial. So this really gives yeah. our partners, gives our sellers, and our customers an accelerated time to a business outcome. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to say that that to me seems like your greatest advantage is the partners that you have out there, and yeah. that simplifying it to a more cloud operating model definitely helps them go out and have that conversation, yeah. especially where you're saying, hey, they're getting on console and they're showing yeah. it no PowerPoint. I mean, having myself not only been at HPE, but been at Amazon where PowerPoint <laughs> was taboo. No yeah, Basically, yeah. I, I think it does strengthen their abilities to go out there and do that. Are you finding that from them? Absolutely. No, our partners have access to uh, our demo tools and uh, you know they are using them. And it really has transitioned from a 
you know, tell me to a show me um, environment. And that's what we have to do as we move to solution-based um, selling, right? It's about outcomes. Yep. Um, and I think that you have to think, look at the, the buying centers as well, the personas within customers. Uh, you know, that's a lot of the conversation that's been coming up here with partners, right? Uh, they're also making that transition and we're helping, that, uh, helping them with that uh, by giving them access to those um, tools and, um, and enablement. What's the hardest part of making that transition? And I, mean, I suppose it's, it's, it's somewhat, I mean, a lot of it's probably cultural, but there's, there's technical aspects of it and then there's people you know, in process. Maybe you could sort of share some of your insights in terms of how you've affected that transition in the group. Why don't you go first? Yeah, I, I think it's about getting people to try it first, right? You know, that first time um, and, and selling the value, um, showing really that it's making their lives easier. Um, and we've had great feedback from partners that uh, ha you know, have actually got on board with us. We're definitely showing up differently. We're engaging with their technical community a lot more too, right? Because um, I think storage, uh, you know, is, it is a complicated sell. And so when we get in with partners and we get in with their technical folks, I think is where we're really seeing some momentum. Um, and you know, the, the tools that we talked about, the demos and the show versus the tell is, is really helping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems like that, again, going towards, like you were saying, with the sand management, being able to have that as a cloud service, as a cloud delivered service, makes total sense because people don't want to necessarily install on premise to even go and do this, plus the upgradability, the back end, all the, that, the, the care and feeding aspects of it. Yeah. I, I assume that's what you're hearing from your customers is help me get rid of this care and feeding. I, I want it taken off my plate. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. If you think about, you know, PCBE that we launched today, I mean, it it searches, you, you know, the, the various knowledge bases of the uh, the constituent components in the cluster. It does all your ESX patching. It does your ILO patching. It does your operating system patching for your image. It fully life cycles the switch, the you, you know, the storage. So you do a one button, get me to the latest good config, and you're done. You're not, you're not sitting there piece by piece by piece looking at security bulletins and trying to figure out what to do. So that, the, the giving our customers time back yeah. from the mundane and the rote, which by the way, can get them in big trouble when you get wrong, as, as you know, right? You, Absolutely. You get a wrong security patch on something, you fail a compliance report, things get tough, right? So really taking, automating that and taking that burden has been received very well. The trust factor, people are afraid of automation sometimes, but if they, if they trust you, they're going to turn it over The other thing uh, with PCB too, it's good to mention in terms of making things simpler, is the announcement today with our partnership with Equinix. Yes. Uh, which means that we have pre-provisioned PCB, private cloud, you know, um, across you know, different regions. Um, you know, so there's plenty of benefits and we're getting really good uh, feedback from customers about that too, quick provisioning. We, we had the Canadian lottery on earlier today, they were, that's exactly what they did. They went through that case yeah. study. I got a last question, we're up against the clock here. So I know it's the year of storage, but it's also the year of AI. So <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been using AI in your portfolio for, for years, but, but now since the whole world is thinking about it, how are you guys thinking about, it? have you changed the way you think about AI at all? Have your customers sort of, of, of catalyzed any new thinking? So, I think a couple things hold true. Um, obviously, from the keynote this morning, you saw kind of a, a very you know, strong, opinionated perspective from the company yeah. on AI, and we do believe we have uh, a real right to play and actually a right to lead. Mm. Um, specific to storage, uh, what we're seeing is um, the expansion of unstructured data lakes uh, for the purpose of analytics, which is why we made one of the big moves we made on April 4th, and you'll see us continue. So we do really good in kind of, you know, low latency OLTV type apps, you know, mm -hmm. think of it as airline ticketing, bank record processing, but people are also now starting to pay attention to, okay, I want to dump a bunch of this data into a data lake and I want to train a model against it. Classic would be weather forecasting. I'm going to take 10 years worth of previous weather run my current model against it and help tune it and train it. So we're definitely seeing, you know, a lot of these data lakes used to be very more vertical uh, 
and, and maybe a little bit more narrow, uh, we're certainly seeing it pop up just about everywhere right now. So if you think about combining our compute assets with our scale out high performance uh, file asset now, it's a good combination. And you'll continue to see us iterate on this as we move forward. And file is the dominant platform on which the, the systems are going to be you know, operating these yeah. AI systems, right? Yeah. And the cloud is not known for its file prowess. You know, the, so far it's struggled with, with being basically, hey, it's simple, get put. But file has been a different story. Yeah. Uh, file's hard, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thanks so much for coming on. Congratulations. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having us. Yeah. It's wonderful awesome. to see you again. See you again. Enjoy I the risk a, of discovery. I was excited to be on theCUBE and, and spend some time with you. So Always please enjoy you the rest of your discover, and uh, hopefully uh, it's worth your while, and thank you for making the trip. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, hey, keep it right there. We got more action. Dave Vellante, Rob Streche, John Furry is in the house, Lisa Martin. Up next, Intel is back in theCUBE. We're going to talk about the future of AI powered. Silicon, you're watching The Cube, the leader, live tech coverage from HPE Discover in Las Vegas. We'll be right back. Yeah.